Well, here we are with another case of, wait, that was a book first? Although, having watched the movie for the first time and seeing its reputation online, this may also be a case of, wait, that was a movie? William Friedkin was a master filmmaker, and although most of his stone-cold classics happened before 1990, he proved he still had plenty in the tank with things like The Hunted and Bug to name a few after. He was a replacement director on today's movie, which seems surreal considering his talents, and he was one of three credited writers on a little-remembered horror movie adaptation from 1990. The Guardian is based on The Nanny, no, not that one, from 1987, and it's a strange pairing of source material and finished product. Both pieces of media are mostly slept on in their respective fields, but how close did Freakin and the other writers come to matching the book? Always do a background check on your employees as we find out what happened to this adaptation. Universal Pictures in 1989 decided to option a book by Dan Greenberg, who had had some success with his works being adapted already. The movie was The Guardian, and it was based on the novel The Nanny from 1987. Originally, the studio had tapped Sam Raimi to direct after he was coming off of the failure of Crime Wave and the success of Evil Dead 2. He would eventually drop out to direct Darkman, and boy, did we luck out. While the original script for The Guardian may have turned out to be a decent Sam Raimi flick, and let's be honest here, there's a strong chance we would have seen Bruce Campbell in a bigger role. If he stays, we most likely don't get Darkman, and that would be a travesty. Exit Sam Raimi and enter the legendary Oscar winner William Friedkin. It's claimed by the original writers that the first script was sillier and more up Raimi's alley, but Friedkin would get very involved and rewrite it enough to get a credit. Friedkin started his Hollywood career with the TV movie The People vs. Paul Crump in 1962, but hit it big in the 70s with a trio of heavy hitters that were The French Connection, The Exorcist, and Sorcerer that was a remake of the great 1950s French film The Wages of Fear. While he would never match the success of that trilogy again, the man who died out of spite to haunt David Gordon Green would have hits well into the 2000s. The writers on the movie include Friedkin, as well as both Stephen Volk and author of the book Dan Greenberg. Greenberg had a solid and lengthy career that included a lot of adapting his own work. Today's movie and Private School are probably his most famous movies, but none of them really lasted in the public zeitgeist. Volk, by certain accounts behind the scenes, was driven to a nervous breakdown with a number of changes, but he had a fun career with his first screenplay being for Ken Russell's Gothic. After today's movie, he did the TV movie Ghost Watch. The rewrites didn't just stress Volk out either, as many of the actors, particularly Jenny Seagrove, were frustrated by the constant changing. Speaking of which, Jenny Seagrove, along with Dwyer Brown and Carrie Lowell, round out the main three cast members. The late, great Miguel Ferrer and Brad Hall are also in there. Seagrove, who plays the villain here, also appeared in Local Hero, among a ton of other things. Dwyer Brown has been a that guy for a while with credits in Field of Dreams, House 1 and 2, To Live and Die in LA, and Gettysburg. Carrie Lowell hasn't had that long of a career, but it's an impactful one with 50 episodes of Law and & Order, and of course as one of the tougher Bond girls in License to Kill. Miguel Ferrer needs no introduction, but I'll give a special shout out to Nightflyer, and Brad Hall is actually more of a writer than an actor. The Guardian made $17 million at the box office, but I can't find its budget, and it didn't do well with critics, with Roger Ebert hating it especially, and more than most. The Nanny is a relatively short novel written by Dan Greenberg and published in 1987. Greenberg was born in Chicago and got degrees from the University of Illinois and UCLA. While he was first published in Esquire magazine, he would go on to be an editor for other publications and end up writing several fiction and non-fiction stories. His first wife was actually famous author and director Nora Ephron, and even though we are discussing an adult horror novel today, his biggest contribution to literature is through a series of kids' books called The Zack Files. That series would even be turned into a Canadian TV show that lasted over 50 episodes. To stay relevant, he would often visit schools and chat with the kids there, or even throw some of his ideas at them to see what they thought. In addition to today's movie being adapted by Friedkin and Company, he would also write screenplays for some of his other works that got turned into film or TV series. He lived until the age of 87 and just passed away at the end of 2023.
A couple moves from Chicago to another big city where the husband, Phil, gets a job at an advertising firm and the wife works within interior design. They become pregnant and have a baby boy, but both wish to keep working and decide to go through an agency to hire a nanny. While an English woman is a possibility, they aren't entirely sold on her until they'll ultimately decide to hire her. She bonds with the child almost instantly and Phil even walks in on her giving the boy a bath with her inside the tub too. He finds her very attractive and even has a dream that he's having an affair with her. Eventually, there are some very questionable things that come up about the nanny and the couple is warned by a former employer of the dangers that the nanny presents. People that have a relation to the couple die and it's clear that nanny is something much more than just a caretaker. They try and flee from the nanny, but one of the family members becomes sick with a coma-like mystery illness and they're forced to fight the nanny to save themselves. Phil is able to kill her and all three of the family members surprisingly survive their shocking ordeal. This is a case of a bunch of writers, including the original author, bringing in a ton of different ideas as well as the director having a certain vision. That director is William Friedkin, and he typically has the sway to get what he wants. The bare bones of the story is certainly present. The book couple is Phil and Julie Pressman, while the movie is Phil and Kate Sterling. They have a baby boy in both stories, with Jake as the name in the movie and Harry in the book. They end up hiring a very attractive English nanny who's named Camilla in the movie and Lucy Redman in the book. The two types of media split fairly drastically from there, however. The book opens with a flash forward of the nanny creature going after Phil and his family in a house in upstate New York from both Phil and the monster's point of view. Also, the book takes place after the couple moves to New York while the movie takes place in LA. The movie shows us exactly what the nanny is, kind of, as she is with a different family and takes the younger child to a tree to sacrifice. That's probably one of the main differences. The movie monster is a tree nymph monster that has ties to a specific tree and must keep it alive, while the book nanny monster is more of an undead creature. The book does a good job not fully explaining much or showing what she's really capable of until the end, while the movie takes the makeup and special effects approach to show what she can do. She can also summon and even shift into the form of a wolf in the movie, while the book she's just very strong and resilient to most attacks. The tertiary characters also vary from page to screen, with Phil's co-workers being focal points and his boss even dying trying to protect him in the novel. What's cool in the book is that we never really know how the nanny kills her victims, but boy is it described as brutal in the aftermath. The boss character in the book, Mary Margaret Sullivan, is somewhat replaced by Ned who is the architect that built the house that Kate and Phil moved into in the movie. He has a crush on Camilla and finds out what she really is, even though it cost him his life before he tries to warn them with a phone message. The violence in the movie is really amped up from the book, while the story has a much more dread-inducing implied tone. A great example of this is the biker scene from the movie where Camilla and her tree absolutely wreck a gang that is trying to assault her that simply doesn't exist in the book. While there are quite a few things taken directly from the book, such as some of the names and even scenes, they are clearly two different stories told from the same idea. We learn of what Camilla did through the poor family shown in the beginning, while the book Phil finds out by calling the references given by Lucy. There are very short chapters intercut that have a nameless man in a hospital of some kind, and we slowly learn that his family was destroyed by Lucy, and he eventually gets a call into Phil to warn him. While the book has that opening chapter, just like the movie shows the prologue chapter of the family before, it's much more effective and original, told by the short, disjointed chapters that randomly appear. The final big difference is with the ending. While Julie and Harry in the book become comatose from whatever power that the nanny exudes, it's just the baby in the movie, and the movie has a much more definitive ending than the book. Camilla is killed along with her tree and melts away completely, while the final chapter of the book has Miss Redman trying to get with another client, having healed from all her injuries and possibly being immortal. Both in the realms of Friedkin's filmography and 90s horror in general, The Guardian isn't discussed or even remembered that fondly. It has a Scream Factory Blu-ray and is a neat if not messy horror movie to enjoy once. The same, however, could be said of the book, which has no Wikipedia entry, let alone any other YouTube deep dives into it. While it's one of a handful of books by the author that got turned into a movie, it's certainly not his most famous contribution. That being said, it's a very quick read and not an expensive book to find. While neither will stay with you for the rest of your life, I think the book explores more interesting and clear ideas and makes its characters much more relatable in the end. 
My vote is the book, but check out both and decide for yourself.